I don't know if you've noticed this, but aside from the fact that we in the Churches of Christ don't use instruments of music in our public worship, I think that's it's always been something that people have noticed about us, certainly things that people have said to me, oh, you people don't, where do you go to church? Oh, you're a minister for the Church of Christ. Oh, you're the people that don't use instruments. Just one of the features, you know, they might not understand why that is, they might not you know, be for or against such a thing, they just happen to notice that uh, we're unusual, there's no organ, no band, no nothing, we just, we just sing. That's one of the features of our public worship. Another, less commented on, but certainly uh, more and more unique as time moves on, is the fact that um, none of our female members uh, participate in the leadership of public worship. Uh, that's another thing that visitors not If you've grown up in the church, you're kind of used to that idea, but if you're just visiting or you've never been to a, a you know, service of the Church of Christ, you'll notice that, wait a minute, a man gets up, he prays, a man does the announcements, men serve the communion, a man gets up to sing the songs, another man gets up to preach, a man does the closing prayer, another man exhorts the congregation, you know, where are the women? Certainly. There are spiritually minded, intelligent, capable women. You know, this is what outsiders would say. One of the most controversial issues it's becoming in the religious world, the role of women in ministry. Some say that this is the key debate of our generation. You know, Harold was talking about our generation. Our generation today as denominational churches are allowing women to preach, to serve as leaders, as pastors, so on and so forth. I don't know about the congregation over here on this side, Grace Church, but I do know that the Methodist Church on Choctaw Road, a woman there is pastor. I remember going to a funeral there once and she was the one who was leading the service. History, however, shows that from the very beginning, how women would serve in the church and what their role would be has always been a subject of many questions. It's like it's kind of new for this generation, but it's not a new thing. Of course, the nature of the question has not changed. I was doing a little research and found out that in the late 1890s and 1900s, there were many, many articles in Brotherhood magazines and newspapers debating the question of a practice where certain congregations in our brotherhood, this is back in 1890 now, in 1900, certain congregations were allowing women to lead in prayer or to teach mixed Bible classes and even in some rare occasions uh, some women were getting up to preach. Today, as was the case you know, 100 years ago, even 2,000 years ago, the Bible provides the answers to these questions and issues. The problem is a lot of times when you're having this discussion, role of women in the church, so on and so forth, people want to argue or debate with you based on how they feel. Well, I feel it's not fair. Well, I feel in this day and age, and I feel this and I feel that. You know? and, 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 and how we feel, this is not the way that we decide religious issues. We decide religious issues based on this. Not how I feel, what does this say? So I think it would be proper at this time and useful at this time to just, let's just go back to the book and see what does the Bible, especially the New Testament, what does it say about this question of the role of women in ministry and why or why not? Uh, why or why not are they not included in public worship. The reason for that? Is it a tradition? Is it misogyny? Is it male chauvinism? What's the problem? Are we old fashioned? Are we legalists? Well, what's, what's our problem? As some would say. Well, first of all, we need to understand that God ordained the roles of men and women in the family and in the church, but not in politics or in business. We need to kind of separate that. The progress of fair and equal treatment for women in the workplace, this is a just and necessary and worthy thing to support and to praise. If a woman is an accountant, she ought to be making the same money as the male accountant in that department. If a woman is a physician, she ought to be making the same money as her male counterpart. That's, that's like almost like a no-brainer. 
Also, we should elect the very best person to lead in government, whether it's local government, the mayor, all the way up to the presidency. This type of choice should be based on uh, integrity and courage, wisdom, creativity, compassion, knowledge, experience. You know, these are the ways that we decide who our leaders should be, not wealth, how rich they are, certainly not the color of their skin, or their gender. So that also is a worthy thing in our country and in our nation. We have women who serve well, our state, Governor Fallon, uh, and at every level, women have distinguished themselves in public service, and that's a good thing. In the family, however, and in the church, God has established and communicated His will on the specific roles that men and women are to occupy. You know, some things they change with time, customs, traditions, technology, attitudes. Things have changed with time for the better. For example, for women in the, in the workplace, for women in politics, that women should have the right to vote and so on and so forth. These things have changed and that was a good thing. But other things are timeless and they remain regardless of the age we live in or the country that we happen to inhabit. The roles of men and women in marriage and in the church are things that the Bible says do not change. I'll just read one passage, familiar one. Jesus answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. That's why the one who created them from the beginning has a right to establish what the role is because he's the one who created them from the beginning. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh what therefore God has joined together let no man separate. Why did I read this passage? I read this passage because Jesus said God has established male and female. God has established marriage from the beginning and God continues to establish the roles that each play in marriage from the beginning to the very, to the very end. Jesus confirms that the institution of marriage, for example, was permanent and not subject to change, despite how human laws and customs have changed. It doesn't matter if the NFL won't bring a team to this city or won't have its, 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 its a Super Bowl in North Carolina because the, the people of North Carolina, you know, they don't want men to go into women's bathrooms. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what the NFL says or what Hollywood says. Who cares what they say? Since when are they the purveyors of what is right and good and just? Since when? It's God who decides. Why? Because God is the one who says, or Jesus says, God is the one who made them male and made them female and made the man and the woman into one union in marriage. Not two men, not two women, not a man who thinks he's a woman, not a woman who thinks he's a man. That's human, sinful, fleshly perversion at work, codified by laws, influenced by public opinion, driven by sinful men and sinful women in powers of position. Let's keep our eyes open, folks. The Bible teaches specific things about the woman's role in the home, in the world, in the church. So our study will, this morning will focus on her role in the church, especially in regards to teaching and authority and roles of leadership. Can't do it all, only got about 30 minutes, so we'll focus on the woman's role in ministry in the church. What does the New Testament say on that? Now the Gospels do not deal with this issue directly in commands or examples, but we see that in every instance where teaching is done in Jesus' name, it's always done by the men. Notice He sent out 70 men. It doesn't say a mixed group of men and women. He sent out 70 men. He could have picked one woman, 35 and 35, 20, 50. 
he sent 70 men. And then when he chose his closest disciples, apostles he called them, he chose 12. Boy, if there ever was an opportunity to make a precedent, and if there was ever someone who was permitted to make a precedent, it was Jesus, and what does he do? He chooses 12 men. Even after we lose one of them, Judas, and we got to pick one, what do they do? There are men and women up in the upper room, right? Godly women, believing women, smart women, spiritual women. What does he do? And they pick another man. Women are Jesus' disciples. They support his ministry. The first to witness the resurrection. Are you kidding me? What kind of honor that is? But the commission to establish the church given to the apostles, not to women. Again, Jesus had the authority to do so, but he chose not to. There's a reason for that. So let's look in the book of Acts, for example. Um, yes, Matthew 28, 20, forgot to read that one. Jesus saying to the apostles, to observe all that I command you. Well, all that I command you includes all the teaching that the apostles give regarding the role of men and women in the church. That's included in the all that I command you. So let's go to a chapter, uh, book of Acts, shall we? There it is, Acts chapter one, verse 21. It says, therefore it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. So men and women are gathered after the resurrection and the ascension and a man, the term here is for male, not generic human being, a man, it says, had to be chosen to replace Judas. Many women were there, as I mentioned, also witnesses of the resurrection, but Peter specified a man. Could have been time to establish a precedent. If not then, why not? Because the inspired apostles were led to choose a man. It was God's will. Let's look at Acts chapter 18, verse 26. It says, and he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This is Apollos, he was preaching. And his preaching was lacking in certain information. Here's an instance where a man in the company of, excuse me, here's an instance where a woman in the company of her husband is teaching a man. The issue is not here a woman teaching a man, but a learned man, Apollos, humbling himself to learn the gospel more perfectly from a common educated tent maker and his wife. This is not an issue of gender here. Some people use this you know, as a gender issue. Woman was teaching. No, no, this, this was an issue of class. Apollos was a high class, a learned man, an educated man. These guys were tent makers. They were common, blue collar workers, these guys. And the Bible said that these guys, this man and this woman, these blue collar guys, they taught this high class guy, Apollos, more perfectly concerning the gospel. Not a gender issue, a class issue. Acts 21, on the next day we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the evangelist who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. I chose this particular scripture and if you'll notice my lesson, I'm just going through the scriptures that deal with women and teaching throughout the New Testament. I chose this scripture to show that women received gifts. In this case, the gift of prophecy. But we never see or hear them using their gifts in the public assembly. As a matter of fact, the next verse after this one shows that Agabus, who was also a prophet, came and prophesied to Paul about his future imprisonment. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. A lot of passages there that deal with this. 1 Corinthians, it says, be imitators of me just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the tradition just as I deliver them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of the woman, of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Every man who has something on his head while praying or prophesying disgraces his head. But every woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying disgraces her head, for she is one and the same as the woman whose head is shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, let her also have her hair cut off. But 
If it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Therefore the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. However, in the Lord neither is a woman independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as the woman originates from the man, so also the man has his birth through the woman. And all things originate from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her. For her hair is given to her for a covering, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. A long passage I know. But the issue here is that women in the church should maintain the visible symbol of their submission to their husbands, which in that day was the covering of, of the head with a veil. That's the point here. To remove the veil, Paul says, was to reject their role of submission to their husbands in that culture. Freedom in Christ did not permit men to be free from the family responsibility, nor did it free from the woman being in submission to their husbands. That was what was happening here. This symbol should be in place when it ex exercising spiritual gifts that perhaps husbands didn't have. So that uh, although praying and prophesying, they still demonstrated a submission to their husbands. Again, I'm trying to explain this passage as it was being uh, interpreted in that time. So this passage doesn't talk about the public assembly. It talks about a woman's attitude in balancing her freedom in Christ and her role as a woman. To remove the veil in that era would be a disgrace, Paul says. Why? Because in that era, prostitutes were the ones that didn't wear veils. Like today, you want to spot a prostitute, you go to some area in town, how do you spot the prostitute? Well, short skirts, high boots, too much makeup, you know, uh, revealing clothing, that's how you spot them, right? Well, uh, in those days, how did you spot them? They didn't have a veil. They just took the veil off. They were available, no pun intended. But Christian women did not do that. That was a disgrace. And what was happening with that was that Christian women were saying, hey, we're free in Christ, right? We're free in Christ. Well, let's remove the veil, whoops. They were just a little too fast ahead of the curve. Today the veil, yeah, it's not an issue. Today it's not an issue. So in verse 11, 17, it starts a section about the assembly and what is supposed to happen at the assembly. So this passage here is talking about the woman, her attitude towards her husband in submission, and how she was to demonstrate this publicly. Even if she had gifts of, uh, of prophecy or had the ability to pray, she wore the veil in order to demonstrate her submission to her husband. In verse 17 to 34, uh, Paul talks about uh, the attitude and the proper conduct during the Lord's Supper. In 12, uh, 1, 31, this is Corinthians here, he talks about every member being necessary. In 13, you know, chapter 13, love promotes unity. Chapter 14, the proper use of gifts. And then in chapter 14, 33 to 40, here he talks about the proper attitude and conduct of women in the assembly. That's the point I'm making. I'm sorry it's taken me a while to get there. At the beginning, it's the attitude of women with their husbands, okay, and society. Verse 33 to 40, attitude of women as regards their role in the church, all right? So in verses 33 um, to 40, he says the following. In verse 33, he says, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. So the instructions that he's going to give here, they're for all the churches, not just the social conditions going on in Corinth. Verse 34, he says, the women are to keep silent in, church, in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. So what is he saying here? 
He says the women are to keep silent in the church, in the public assembly. The Greek word here means absolute silence. They're not permitted to speak. Again, the Greek verb which means to talk or to speak. Same verb used that, you know, speaking in tongues, same verb here. They can pray. Doesn't mean they, they led prayer, simply that when the church prayed they could also pray, they could say amen. They could sing because Ephesians 4 says that all should sing. But they're not permitted to speak, which means their gifts of prophesying must be exercised in other situations other than the public assembly. And isn't it marvelous that we had the women's retreat this weekend? And you had women who had the gift of prophecy. When I say prophecy, I mean the ability to teach, to encourage, to build up, to edify. The women prayed, the women taught, the women sang, the women led singing, the women uh, uh, exhorted other women, and it was satisfying. Women with gifts were able to exercise their God-given gifts, and other women were edified. On the contrary, from being allowed to speak their role in the church, Paul says in the mixed assembly, is to be in subjection as the law teaches. So Paul begins by claiming that man was the head of woman. Remember way back in 11 verse 3? that women were created for man and after man, 11, 8, and 9. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, 14, he teaches that her submission is based on the fact that she was deceived and not man, and her submission to her husband was ordained by God because of this. That women be silent in the church was based on the principle established in the Old Testament and reaffirmed in the New. And if you're wondering, what's the point in all of this? I just made it. I'll repeat it. Paul, teaching, Paul teaches in 1 Timothy 2 that a woman's submission is based on the fact that she would, excuse me, that women be silent in the church was based on the principle that was established way back in the Old Testament and then reaffirmed in the new by Jesus, by Peter, by Paul. It's not a custom. It's not a question of culture. It's a matter of how things work in the kingdom of God without reference to how things work in the world. You see, we are in the kingdom of God, in the church. And things in the kingdom of God work differently than things in the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of the world. And the problem is, some people say, well, yeah, but things are changing out in the world and women are doing this and women are, we may even have a woman president and so on and so forth. You know? So the church ought to change too. Really? Are you telling me that the way the world is changing is the way we ought to change? I don't think so. In verse 35 he says, if they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Is that Paul saying that? Paul, and he's accused of being misogynist or a, you know, a, a chauvinist. But well, we believe this is the Spirit of God speaking through Paul. That's who's speaking here. Now it's not popular. You know, this lesson's being you know, broadcast online and there might be some people online that are going, oh, we gotta, we gotta sue that guy. You know, the word husband here could be seen as men at home. Women are to ask the men at home outside the General Assembly for general instruction. Today, we have Bible class, Sunday school, that functions to provide a place where women can receive instruction from men without violating this principle. Paul repeats his injunction by saying that it is shameful, it's improper when women speak in the assembly. It's improper for the woman to get up and to give the sermon. Verse 36 and 7. Now, now I, this passage here, nobody ever has a comeback for this passage. He said, was it from you that the word of God first went forth, or has it come to you only? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, let him recognize that the things which I write to you are the Lord's commandment. Not the Lord's suggestion, the Lord's commandment. 
This is the passage I use when people say to me, well, Paul was a creature of his times. In those days, they didn't have gays. In those days, they didn't have, you know, women didn't do anything. They were in subjection, blah, blah, blah. And Paul, you know, th this was a cultural problem. But today, you know, things have changed. Well, things have changed in the world, but they haven't, have they? Because in the first century, people were killing each other. They were committing adultery. There was homosexuality. There was all kinds of evil and sin. And it just has continued into this century. So the world has not changed. And you know what, brethren? The church has not changed either. And should not change. It wasn't the Corinthians' domain to establish scripture or apostolic example in regards to conduct or doctrine. That's what Paul is saying. If they see themselves as spiritual, let them recognize that what has been given here is directly from the Lord. A command, he says, from the Lord. Let's not blame the elders or the preachers. Or, you know, let's not blame them and say, oh, you know, they want to be in charge of everything. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I would dearly love to give over to the women many of the things that we do in the church because they get it done. <laughs> Galatians. Chapter three, he says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the famous passage also that says, well, you know, we're all one in Christ. We're all the same. But Paul says that we are all united into one common body, one salvation, one purpose by Jesus Christ. In other words, we are all precious and saved and inhabited by the Spirit. Male, female, free, slave, Jew, Greek, it doesn't matter. All of us are saved in exactly the same way. We're getting exactly the same reward. The Spirit inhabits us exactly in the same manner. What has not changed is my role as a man in my home and my role as a minister or servant in the church. That hasn't changed. It doesn't say we abandon our roles as men and women. Ephesians 5. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. We are to submit to one another in love and humility and service. The next passage reaffirms, however, that we do not change our roles or responsibility as men and women. Mutual submission in the church does not mean an elimination of roles, as some argue. Some pass, you know, they go to this passage and say, look, we, we have to submit to one another, so therefore we don't need to submit to the elders and you know, the women shouldn't submit to the... No, he's not saying that. I submit to my sister in Christ. How? Because I respect her. The older women as mothers, the younger women as sisters. I treat them in, 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 in love, and in respect, in purity, in honor. That's how I submit to them and how they submit to me. First Timothy chapter two. For this reason I was appointed a preacher and apostle. I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. So uh, as an apostle, Paul teaches them concerning their conduct and their role in the church. The reason I showed this passage is to show you that Paul is setting up what he's going to tell them. He's going to say, here's how you ought to conduct yourself in the church. Okay? So we go to verse eight. He says, therefore, I want the men, to, uh, the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. The men, again, the word used, generic, males, to pray. Worthy men are to pray in every place. And it certainly means in the public 
assembly. Verse nine and 10, likewise I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women making a claim to, godly, uh, to godliness. Godly women are to concentrate on good works, not good looks. Some have used this passage to say, oh, you're not allowed to put on makeup, you're not allowed to wear pants, you can't wear jewelry, you can't have your hair done at the hairdresser's. No, it's not what he's saying. He's saying, make sure that it's your good works that you're focusing on and not you know, the interior, not the exterior. Good works, not good looks. Verse 11. He says, a woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. How can you twist this to mean or say something different? A woman's learning, which, she has, uh, which was not to be denied, this was revolutionary at this time. The women needed to be taught equally. Today we think nothing of that, but in those days that was, are you kidding me? That was revolution. That women should receive instructions? Puh. Her freedom and value in Christ gave her access to learning which she did not have in the Jewish system where the men and the women were actually separated. This learning, however, was to be done in quietness, without agitation, without herself taking an active part in the teaching. This learning in quietness needs to be done with an attitude of, what does he say? Submissiveness. The word means to place oneself under. It means to place oneself under willingly. This isn't slavery. The wife who's in submission to her husband, she gives this submission as a gift to her husband. It is the most precious gift she gives him. In return, he gives her the assurance that he is ready to give himself, his life up for her. That's his precious gift. I've never met a man whose wife was in submission to him who did not want to give his life for his wife. And I've never met a woman who knew that her husband would give his life for her who would not happily give him her submission in love. Verse 12, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. So a woman is not, what does he say, is not to teach a man. Not that a woman is not to teach. I mean, women were encouraged to teach unbelievers, Priscilla and Aquila, to teach each other, Titus 2, and to teach their children, 1 Timothy 3.15. They were not permitted, however, to teach men in the assembly. This was the role of pastors, evangelists, teachers, elders, if you wish, who were men. And a woman was not to have authority over a man. A woman was not to be in a position of authority over a man in the church, not in government or at Tinker. This role was not given to her by God. Even if elders gave a woman the opportunity to preach and gave her the authority, the word does not give this. It is not something which is to be given. She is rather to remain in peacefulness and in quiet. Verse 13 to 15. For it was Adam who was first created, then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctify with self-restraint. So Paul answers, why is it like this? He says, well, the position of the sexes was established by God at creation. Woman was quite deceived, he says, not man. Woman's primary role is as homemaker and will be preserved in this role through faith and purity and love. It doesn't mean that women cannot work outside the home. It simply clarifies her important and primary role inside the home. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Deacons must also be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children in their own households. Only men can be deacons. Why? Because a woman cannot be the husband of one wife. Well, in our society she can. <laughs> Titus 1.6, namely if a man is above reproach, the husband of one wife having children who believe not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Only men can be elders. Women cannot be the husband of one wife. Romans 16.1, 
I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is in Chincrea. The word here, this, the reason I show this, this is another passage that people show. Look, she was a deacon. If you can have a woman deacon, then you should be able to have a woman elder. Well, the problem here is the language doesn't support that idea. That's the, that's a, that's the tricky thing about language. You know? It means what it means, not what you want it to mean. And so the word diakonos here, servant, it can be translated in three ways in the New Testament. It can be translated, whoa, <laughs> it can be translated minister, okay, 27 times, translated as minister, diakonos, translated seven times as servant, translated only three times as deacon, and translated deacon only in context where a person actually holds the office as an official deacon, helper to the elders. So in Romans 16, 1, the translation is servant, servant. She was a, Phoebe was a servant in the Lord. How was she a servant? She took a message from one place and she traveled to Rome to bring the message to Paul. She was a servant. So what are the responsibilities and limitations of today's Christian woman in the church? Women are responsible to make disciples, to teach others the words of Christ, to maintain fellowship, to serve the church and the world in the name of Christ, to offer the Lord their sincere and enthusiastic worship. They are limited in only two specific areas. They're, they do not pray or lead or teach in a mixed worship assembly, one, and two, they do not hold positions of authority over men, again, in the church. And here it is. I know it's been a little long, but there were so many scriptures that talked about this. Here it is. I do not apologize for this sermon. Okay? I'm not hedging my bet. I don't apologize for this sermon because if this is God's way, then it is perfect and desirable and blessed is the church that abides by God's will in this matter even if it feels wrong in today's society. On the contrary, we should encourage our young women to accept this teaching and we should train our young men to be wise and caring leaders, knowing the responsibilities that they will have to carry one day. Uh, no offense to our elders, but you are not getting any younger. And some of you 40 and 50 year old guys, you're going to have to step up to the plate sooner or later. Take on some leadership, get with the program, take a risk. We may have different roles of service in the church, but both men and women have exactly the same need and that is to have their sins washed away in the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's not let the worldly debate over men, women things, you know, let's not let that distract us. Women are sinners, they need Christ. Men are sinners, they need Christ. Men and women are to work together in the church according to God's plan to proclaim the message. You know in Bible talk, right? 12,000 people a month go to our website to download material to hear the gospel. In a period of three months, almost 4,000 e-books are downloaded by people who are reading this material. I could go on and on with the numbers, but the point I want to make, the majority of the people who work for Bible Talk are women. They type they translate, they edit, they transcribe, they format, they maintain the, the budget, they do, they do most of the work. Hal just sits behind the camera <laughs> and I just talk. So whether you're a man or a woman, God calls you to cleanse your conscience in the blood of Christ. And whether you're a man and a woman, you do this by confessing His name, repenting of your sins, and being baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. So whether you're a man or a woman this morning, if you need Christ, 
in your life today, then we encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of invitation.